this is a case that we're going to look at today. It's, it's not a, a real case, but uh, it's a case that we've made up for the purposes of, of these workshops. So we're describing a 16-year-old uh, girl uh, who we have de uh, sequencing data from the girl herself and from her parents, uh, and she has muscular dystrophy. And she, these are her main clinical features, muscle weakness, dystrophic uh, muscular dystrophy confirmed by biopsy, uh, quadriceps muscle atrophy, and myalgia. So if we were to go into phenotypes, and I just want to show you how easy it is to create a record for this individual. So you would create a new patient. One thing, Dorota, I think we're going to host, are we going to, are you recording this video? Will we host it afterwards? Yes, I'm recording. Okay. So if I go through anything too quickly today, hopefully you'll be able to uh, go back to it in more detail uh, by watching the video again. So you create a new patient, and then we have a, a number of templates that we've uh, designed uh, for historic projects, uh, particularly with a neuromuscular focus, actually. So this webinar is in particular at the N N Neuromuscular Disease European Research Network, although I understand there are, there are other people who aren't necessarily involved in neuromuscular diseases here today, but this, this webinar will be equally relevant for you, but it has a slight focus towards this use case. So if we select the, the muscular dystrophy template, what this opens is an abbreviated form of all the, all the possible entries, uh, all the possible data that you could enter into phenotypes. So this was designed for some of our researchers to make their life easier. So the first thing we need to do, sorry, is to put in a, an identifier for our case. So th this would be whatever you use as your local identifier. Oh, I see I haven't deleted my previous test. Yeah, in this case, yeah. Is there any other number? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So case 3C, and she's a girl. And then we would go down first to these uh, clinical symptoms and physical findings. And here you have a number of submenus that each of them will open up uh, in a tree-like format to let you find the, the phenotypic characteristic that you're looking for. So for example, if we want to go to, the, to enter quadriceps muscle atrophy, uh, if I was familiar with the, once you, once you are familiar or one is familiar with it, we would know this is going to be a muscle box, but uh, sorry, muscle bulk, and it's going to be in atrophy and should be in distal upper, no? Distal lower, sorry. Distal lower limb. And it's not there. Thank you. So if there's a case like this where you think a term should be there and you know what the term is, alternatively, you can type in here quadriceps muscle atrophy and it will find it and it will put it in the it will actually highlight it in the correct place in the hierarchy if the hierarchy is here but you can see it's within limbs in this case which isn't actually one of my options here and uh, it's marked as a term and we could do this with the same for the other cases the other phenotypic characteristics so we have myalgia muscle pain yes this is a constitutional symptom. So what we're doing here is we're describing the case in some detail. The other thing, and obviously you can put in as much detail or as, or as little uh, detail as you want. Okay. Uh, we recommend that you have at least five positive HPO terms wherever possible. I'm assuming everybody can still hear me okay. So the other thing you would want to do, because we have, uh, we also have samples from this individual's parents, is we would go in and we have a very simple, or phenotypes has a very simple pedigree drawing tool. We create a new family here. It's a trio in this case, or at least we have the, the data as if it was a trio, so we have the girl here. And then we could just create her father, K 
ZZ father and create a new identifier. And likewise, we go back to the mother and again, we use a local ID and create new. And then we can save this pedigree. And now if I click here, it takes me to the entry for the father. In this case, we're assuming that the father is unaffected. And you can see the pedigrees already here. And then we could go in and fill in the father by editing this record, uh, fill in the data of the father. In this case, we would just say probably that the father is clinically normal. Uh, and we could add other data if we wanted to. So essentially, once you're familiar with phenotypes, uh, it would take you, uh, assuming you don't have too many HPO terms, it would take you about five minutes to, to put in each case. Uh, I should maybe just step back a little bit and, and say what, uh, what an HPO term is. So what you saw here was that we, we selected we selected these terms to describe this, this girl. Do I have it here? Okay. okay, so the point is that these are standardized terms and what they have behind them, the HPO code, so the human phenotype ontology, it means it has a specific number associated to it. So for example, this might be number 2715. And what this means is, is it's suitable for computers to, to match to other individuals who have the same code. So rather than trying to match on the text, they would match on the code. And the code, as you've seen here, is always part of a, of a hierarchy. So you can also match up and down the hierarchy. So this is useful when you want to try to match make patients based upon their, their phenotypic characteristics. That's to find similar patients to yours who may have a mutation in the same gene or may even have the same mutation. So the next step, once you have your phenotypic data in, let me just check which number that was, 718. Okay, so that would be the first step. The second step here is you need to submit the data corresponding to your patient. So you need to you want to submit the raw sequencing data. This will take a second. So this is this is the ID that we just entered in phenotypes. So you can see these things are all linked. If the sample has, if there's a sample from this in the, is the patient, sorry, is registered in a patient registry for disease, you can, you can put in the patient registry name here. And you can decide whether you want to make your patient matchable or not be a matchmaker exchange. Then you simply submit. That's the first link. And then essentially what we're doing on this next page is we're I'm going to mix cases here. But, uh, on the next page is that we're describing the sequencing data that we wish to submit. So in this case, uh, let's say we're solve, we are would select the project that we want to submit for, so solve RD. Any of the people on this call, if they're going to be submitted data, it will be solve RD. We allow for an embargo. There's various fields that are mandatory, marked with red asterisk, and there's other fields that are optional. Uh, so let's say it's whole blood, it's exome sequencing. Most of the data we have at the moment is exome sequencing. We do have some genomes and panels. And then one thing that's very important for you to know is you need to know which exome enrichment kit was used uh, in order for us to produce the, the best quality data. So let's say this is an Agilent kit. And at the end here, you choose which ERN you're associating this data to, if you're in SolveRD, so ERN NMD. And once again, we can uh, submit. And as I'm improvising, I'm not sure if this one will work, yeah, because the, the phenotypes ID is not correct. Let's see if it works with that. Because they should not. The name is the same also. No, no. Okay. You already used this, this name. Okay. So, because I was practicing earlier, this is uh, not going to work here, but. It's something else, yeah. It's okay. 
I have to select a real one, right? Okay. So once you've done that, stage one, stage two, the final stage here would be that you select the case again that you want to submit the real data, and then you have to have access to your data. Most of the files that people submit are BAMs or fast queues. And you can see this is here. And then you have to know a little bit more about your the, the type of, so you have to state what type of file it is, a BAM, if it was paired or single end sequencing. Your sequencing provider will know this if you don't. And there's a few other fields here that we have marked as mandatory, but we'll be removing them. And then you would submit this. And once you have submitted this, uh, then you will receive an email that will give you instructions on how to transfer that data to us here at CNAG. Once that data is transferred to us, uh, what we do is we reprocess it completely. So all data within the genome phenome analysis platform goes through the same standard analysis pi pipeline that we va uh, verify that and validated that it's, it's as good as uh, any others. Uh, and at the end, we produce the variants uh, we, that are found in your samples, and these get uploaded to the genome phenome analysis platform. So this is where you get to do your own analysis. So this is the whole point, is that you, you can take us middle men more or less out of the equation, and you get to look at your, your own variants, do your own variant uh, prioritization, and, and filtering and prioritization. So this is what the, the GPAP, as we call it, Genome Phenome Analysis Pipeline, looks like when you first log in. Uh, what I'm going to show you today is some publicly available data. Uh, and after the, at the end of the webinar, I'll show you how you can reproduce exactly what I'm doing here, actually. Because this is publicly available and, and open to all. You don't even have to register to, to get access to this. So once you log in, you, this is what, you're, what you see on your screen. And it'll become more obvious what it is. But just to say, there's essentially three sections. The first section is where you define at the top here is where you define the filters you want to apply. The second section is actually at the bottom of the screen will be the raw results of the filters, all the, showing all the variants that pass the various filters that you've requested. And the third section in the middle where we see samples, functional, predictive, population, this, this gives you more detailed information about the results that you've seen. That, that uh, ab about the specific variants. So, you're not seeing my screen. Yes, we're seeing the screen. Can you see that I scroll up and down at the moment? Yes, I can see that. Okay, it's just Le Leslie has lost connection. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, but you cannot see my mouse, right? Um, I my don't pointer. see a mouse. No, you don't see the pointer. No, I'm doing it very fast. You see it now or you don't see it? Okay. So I'll have to do this very slowly then. So first, what I'm do first thing you have to do is select the individual samples you want to analyze. So I'm going to click on this plus here. And because we know we've got three samples we want to analyze, I'm clicking on it three times. And now I'm entering the ID for the sample in which we're interested. So in this case, the case, it's family three. The case is 3C. Her mother is 3M. And her father is 3F. So to the right here, uh, we have an icon that points out to phenotypes. And then further to the right, we can determine where you see checkboxes, ref, 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 alt, alt, alt. We can determine the type of inheritance pattern we're looking for. So in this case, we're looking for an autosomal recessive uh, inheritance pattern. Therefore, in the case, I'm going to look for alt, alt, which means both alleles should be alternative with respect to the reference genome. And you'll see in the, in the parents, I leave them as ref alt because they should each be a carrier of one alternate variant and one reference variant if it's going to be all simple to somewhat recessive. Then to the right of these, you see some quality metrics. 
I don't want to go into too much depth here, uh, but you can vary these to find more high quality variants or to be less stringent if you don't find anything with the good quality variants. Sometimes a, your variant might have bad coverage uh, just, by, just by chance. Uh, then you might want to use less stringent variants. For today's purposes, I'm going to use uh, the defaults. So here you see the minimum depth and minimum number of reads that's covering the position for it to show up in the, field, uh, in the platform. Uh, I've set to 10 and the genome type quality to 30. So these are both relatively low. And there's also here a field for alternative illegal frequency. But again, I don't want to go into that because it'll be slightly, it's going to take a bit too much time today. I can deal with questions on that at the end if you want. So we can, uh, and, and then be below here, we have all the, the filters we can apply. So I just want to basically uh, describe them to you. So the first thing is the type of variant you might be interested in. One thing that makes sense to do first is maybe check if any of your variants in your individuals are in ClinVar. And note that you will always find some, even some pathogenic or some likely pathogenic in every individual. And this may be because uh, they're heterozygote carriers, but they're not homozygote for the disease. Or some of them, some of the things that are in ClinVar are regarded as pathogenic, but they're not actually serious diseases. They may be minor eye problems or, or things like this. But that might be something you want to do first anyway. Here, can you see the tooltip, Dorota? Does it say? Yes, I can see that. Okay, good. So we have many tooltips. So when you hover over many of the fields, it will explain what they mean, because many of them are not intuitive unless you're very familiar with working with variant data. This is not clear. So the first thing is the variant class, for which we use SNPF. And if you hover over high, it tells you that the variant is assumed to have a damaging effect on the protein. So these are generally nonsense or frame shifting mutations. So they are interesting to us, obviously. Uh, or moderate. And moderate are generally mutations that change the sequence but do not damage the protein. So the, mo the majority of moderate are non synonymous variants. They can also be in not, well, not necessarily damaging. So they could be in-frame deletions and insertions as well. So generally, when you're looking at exomes, the first thing you want to do is look at high and, and one of the first things you want to do is look at the high and moderate variant. The next possible filter to apply is the population filters. So as I'm sure most of you are familiar, the, the RD Connect project, as, as Dorot has explained, solve RD going forwards and, and, and the goal of the genome phenome analysis platform in general is that it was designed to look at rare diseases. So we're, we're considering rare diseases here. We're not looking for common heart disease var predisposing variants. You wouldn't be able to find them easily with the platform. So applying any of the commonly used uh, control population data sets is, is a very useful filter, of course. And this is done by, a, by a, a, the allele frequency. So it's a value between zero and one. And we have data from Exact and Nomad, which many of you may know is like Exact but bigger. We still have the thousand genomes pop population data. And actually, in the platform itself, we have internal frequency data, but we won't use that today because this test set is only a set of 15 samples, so it's not a useful frequency. It's not a useful filter, sorry. So I'll come back to those in a minute. The next possible filter you might want to use is the uh, machine learning tool filter. So these are uh, the popular tools that try to predict whether any a particular mutation is likely to be damaging at the protein level. So we have data from mutation taster, polyphen, and SIFT. And then, uh, of course, a very popular uh, filter where you have a good idea of what genes might be involved in your diseases is, is to filter by a candidate gene list. So one thing you can do here is you can upload your own candidate gene list. Or we have a number of predefined uh, gene lists that we have uh, that we feel are useful or that uh, collaborators who use the platform have asked us to add. So we have, for example, the ACMG actionable gene list here. We have Decipher's full gene list. We have a list from Mitocarta for the people interested in the mitochondrial diseases. And perhaps of the most interest for this group, we have a 
we have the muscle gene table gene list, which is a list of when this was uploaded, which was this list was July 2016. So we'll be updating against shortly with the three or four extra that they've added. This is a list of 416 genes that are, have been implicated in, in various neuromuscular diseases. Another thing you can do is you can uh, search OMIM. So if you know what disease you're, you're uh, if you have an idea of what sort of, what disease your case has, you can re uh, retrieve the, the genes that OMIM associates with that disease. Or you can actually pull all the genes that are associated with the HPO terms that you have uh, assigned to your case in phenotypes directly. And I'll show that in a little while. And finally, if you you know if you're interested in a certain part of a certain chromosome or a certain chromosome, you can look at this. Uh, we allow you to upload a bed file, which is a uh, it's a series of regions that you might be interested in. Uh, so it's not just the genes itself, but other parts of the genome. You might know the coordinates. You can upload a bed file with multiple coordinates here. You can upload a coordinate file, which, which is specific positions. And uh, another thing we do for all exome genomes is we pre-calculate runs of homozygosity. So we look for long runs where the individual is homozygous, which is indicative of, uh, of identity by uh, descent. Uh, and if you're looking for a autosomal recessive disease, uh, if the parents are consanguineous, it's very common that you will find the cause of variance in such ones. So you can add as many or as few filters as you want at a time and run the query. You run the query by going back up to the green button at the top where it says run query. So at the moment, all I'm saying is give me all variants that are segregating in an autosomal recessive manner in this pedigree. And in this case, we're looking at whole genomes. So let's see how many variants we have. So these are three whole genomes. And you can see, hopefully at the bottom, it returns, so in the, at the bottom tab where it says phenotype analysis variance exomizer, in the variants it tells you how many variants we have. So we have 220,000 variants. So obviously 220,000 variants is not something we're going to be able to look through manually. And this is why we apply our filters. So I'm going to do this step by step. As I say, you could run everything at once and it would be just as fast, but just to show you how it works. So let's look for variants that are affecting proteins in some way. So high or moderate. We run the query and we immediately drop from 220,000 to 623. Okay. So this obviously is a, a much more manageable number, but still here we will have a lot of, uh, we, we have a lot of signal here, or well, we have a lot of noise essentially if you want. And, and it's, unless you're an expert, it's gonna be very hard for you to pick out a cost of variant from here. So, sorry, I should explain the results a little bit more, I think at this stage. So I'm gonna look at the results here. So what we're seeing here across the top, I'm just gonna look at the first variant. So we have the, the chromosome, the position, if it has a dbSNP ID, it's here. We can see the reference was a G, the alternative was an A. So uh, the case is, uh, homozygous for the alternative, the AA, and the parents are GAGA, as we would expect. And this hits the gene PTCHD2. And the impact of the variant is characterized as moderate. The CAD score is below 20. SIFT says it's tolerated. Polyphen uh, says it's benign. There's no, there's no uh, mutation taster uh, annotation for this position. And then we have the frequencies in EXAC and 1000 Genomes Project and NOMAD here. And you can see like all of these at the top of the page here, all the, all the variants at the top of the page here, top right, they all have a very high frequency. So it's very clear that none of these are gonna be causing our, our, our patients rare disease. So let's go back and, and, and filter by population as well. 
So a rare disease is one in uh, 2000, I think, in Europe. So we can fairly safely filter by an alternative allele frequency of, sorry, of 0 0.02. So this means one in 50 alleles. And we can apply all the filters, not the internal, as I said here. And then, so now we're only going to get back the rare alleles. Okay, so now we've got a much more manageable number. Okay, so we've got 26. And this gets into the realms where, whereby you could look at them almost, almost manually. Uh, if you do know which genes are likely to be involved in your case, you'll probably be able to spot them directly here. But uh, if you need a little more help, if one needs a little more help, for example, if I was uh, uh, analyzing this case on behalf of someone and I'm not an expert in neuromuscular diseases, I would want to know, is this in the muscle gene? There are any of these genes, so are any of these variants in genes which are in the muscle gene table list of 416 important genes? And here, if we run our query, this returns just one variant. Okay, so one variant, it's actually a big uh, insertion. The parents are carriers of the insertion. The child has both copies of the insertion, so it's homozygous for the insertion. And it's in the gene ataxin 3. So at this stage, one thing you can do is you can go up into this middle window here and you can look for more information about the, the type of variant here. So you have some information about the, the quality of the variant here. You can see in this case, the genotype quality is 99, which is the maximum for this variant. And the depth ranges from 16 to 31. So it looks like a good quality variant technically. And what does this, what does this variant do? Well, you can see it, it's all like attacks in one, but it's hitting a number of ensemble transcripts and it's causing an in-frame insertion, right? So this is a glutamine expansion. It's adding eight extra glutamines. So this may, may be damaging, may, may not. And as you can see, you can see all the transcripts. So this gene has lots of transcripts that are affected by this variant. Because of course, sometimes you might find a variant that would have a high impact on the transcript. But if that transcript's not uh, really expressed, or perhaps it's not expressed in the tissue of interest, then that's unlikely to be a, a high impact in the biological sense. And here we have the data from the predictive tools. We have the exact population values, not found in any of these in this case. And we have uh, further menus here which will show which pathways your gene is involved in, if it has protein interactions. So if you know your disease well, these, this sort of information, even if you're looking for a novel gene, even if there was a new gene to you, a taxon free, it might be an indicator that this is a good candidate. Another thing I haven't shown just yet is that we have associated links out to all the useful databases we know of at the moment. So Ensemble here, Exact, Nomad, UCSC. So what this will do, these links will take you to exactly this position in each of these databases. So you don't need to go to the database, your database of choice, and, and search again. This will take you exactly to that position, and you'll be able to see the information you want to see in your favorite database. And we have similar at the level of the gene. So we have links out to Omen, Ensemble, to PubMed, Searches, to Entree, to this position, uh, to this gene in Exac, uh, and GWAS Central, etc. So one thing you might want to do is you might want to check in Omen. What, what, what's this gene involved in? Okay. So here's a taxon three. It's involved in Machado Joseph disease, which I'm not familiar with myself. But one thing that's important here is you can see the inheritance pattern is autosomal dominant. So that means that OMIM says that when you have variants in this gene that cause disease, they do so in an autosomal dominant manner. When we go back to the platform, of course, here we're looking for an autosomal recessive variant. So it doesn't make sense that this could be a causative variant uh, because one of the, if it was dominant and if this was a double hit, uh, one of the parents would have to be affected as well. So this was looking for a simple autosomal recessive, right? To apply, uh, assuming that the parents were each carriers, 
who were heterozygotes and the, and the child was homozygote at that position. Of course, some of you are probably screaming out that it could be a compound heterozygote. So to look at the compound heterozygote, we actually click this compound heterozygote box, which is above the ref ref uh, in the sample selection. You see it's grayed out actually, the, the, the selection of the different alleles, uh, the different genotypes you might be looking for because we are telling it we want to look for a compound tetrazygot. In this case, I'm just going to rerun the query right here. So the only thing I've changed is the inheritance pattern. And we're keeping all the filters we have. And here we see we get two variants back. Now you see we have also some nice color coding here on the right. And the red means, or the pink, dark pink here, means it looks interesting to us. So in this case, ClinVar has the first variant tagged as being uh, pathogenic and the second uh, variant tagged as being pathogenic or likely pathogenic. So here we have two hits. Of course, it's a different gene. It's in ANO5. And from here, we could link directly out to ClinVar. And we can see the description of the, of, of the gene, the disease, and all the reports. And likewise, if we go to ANO5 and we go to OMIM again, here we'll, you can see that it's involved in a number of muscular dystrophies, particularly muscular dystrophy, uh, limb girdle type 2, myoshi muscular dystrophy, and it's an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern. So this is a very good candidate to explain the, the phenotype of uh, our individual here. But of course, this is only an in silico diagnosis, if you like. So you, would, you always have to go back. First thing you have to do is go and check that your variants are real. You want to sequence them in a different manner, or uh, do some RNA-seq if it's appropriate, to confirm that these variants are real and, and they're causing the, causing the disease uh, that matches the phenotype of your individual. So that's where I would like to leave it. There's a lot more we could do. Uh, we need to show a few. The, the, the platform is very, uh, very flexible. So you can do whichever mode of inheritance. You don't have to have a trio. You can have an individual. You can have a pair of affected siblings. You can have a larger pedigree. And you can still apply all the filters you want. And it takes a little bit of, of time to become familiar with, but once you are familiar with it, it it's a very rapid and, and effective way of, of getting a short list of, of variants to take forward for further testing, or indeed re-identifying variants that you already know are implicated in disease that you're interested. So I don't know how we're doing for questions in the chat box. There are some questions, but I think Dorota uh, wrote them down. Okay. she will be able to yes i have okay. uh, listed all the questions um i will maybe connection so um the first i can read them out so the first question by antonia is as you have clinical diagnosis for your patient do you have to enter also an order code in phenotypes so yes we're we're very happy to have an order code in phenotypes in fact if you if you do know that we we encourage you to use an order code so i didn't mention that when i was going through phenotypes but we uh, if you have an order code actually we don't necessarily require you to be so detailed with your hpo because the order code uh, itself gives a lot of information about the, the phenotype of the patient next one So a uh, second question, also from Antonio, is um, does genotype quality refer to GATK quality score? Yes. Okay, that was yes. a short answer. Sorry, yes. So <laughs> GATK goes from 0 to 99. We don't accept anything that's less than 20 because those are very uh, poorly supported variants. Uh, and you'll see actually that most variants tend to be in the high 90s. Uh, but some, some variants might have a lower genotype quality, but they might be, uh, they, they will be real variants. But if the genotype quality was very low, then you might, be let, you might find in some cases, or you will find in some cases for sure, if you try to, re, uh, try to 
uh, retype the variant, do PCR or Sanger sequencing, then, then it might come up negative. So as I say, these are always indications and then you have to go and, and verify. Right. Um, I, yeah, actually can hear me. So the next question comes from Jen, who asked, do you have access to Genomics England gene list in Panel App within the RD Connect platform? Uh, at the moment, no, but that's something that's on our, our list of things to do. So we're actually building uh, what's known, well, they have an API. So what we're doing is building a piece of software to connect directly to, to Panel App so that we can get their gene lists in real time, which means even if they add an extra gene to a gene list tomorrow, when you pull it into the platform, uh, you'll get the up-to-date list. One way you can, if you want, to, if you're already using the platform and you want to get around that at the moment, is what you can do is you can download the gene list from Panel App, and then you could upload it uh, directly into your session on the RD Connect and, and use it for filtering. All right, and um, the next question is: Can you screen for both types of models of modes of inheritance at the same time? For example, compound heterozygote and homozygous. No, at the moment we can't. Uh, one, yes, and at the mo and at the moment we can't. We have thought about doing something like this, and we might uh, implement it for the case of of trios, for example. But actually. Uh, with other cases, it can become more difficult to do it all at once. So at the moment, we don't do it. In the future, we might. But we feel that the platform is relatively efficient at the moment. And you can see how fast it was for me just to switch from autosomal recessive back to compound head. Uh, and you could do that in the other direction as well, of course. So it's not something that's highest priority for us. But it is something that people have requested. And I know some of the commercial platforms uh, will offer that sort of feature. But they're often very restrictive in exactly which, uh, which types of uh, families you can use. So often that's restricted to, to uh, trios, uh, where it's obvious what the case is. The point is, if you were doing a compound hit and using an unaffected sibling, uh, it's not straightforward to, to do it to mark the case and the, the, the affected and the unaffected status. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going on a bit much. So the answer is no. <laughs> okay, so the next question is, uh, can one analyze more than one patient from different family in a single instance? More than one patient from a different, yes, yes. So any uh, samples that you have access to, which essentially is all your samples and all the samples that are post embargo and most samples become post embargo at most six months after they've been uploaded. Uh, you could select those and, and use them, yes. And you can use up to 15 samples, you can, yes. And another feature I haven't shown actually is if you're interested in knowing of variants in a particular gene, you can search across all the samples that are available to you. So at the moment in the platform, that's close to 3,000. And you could find all uh, homozygote alternative variants in your favorite gene and see which individuals, uh, the IDs of which individuals have, have that variant. And this is something we, we plan to release a video tutorial on our YouTube channel very soon. So stay, yes. stay tuned. Um, OK. And the next question is from Enzo, who asks, is it possible to export or download a list of variants from RD Connect in a CSV or XLS format? So at the moment we have that on hold uh, for, for data protection purposes. So we're, we're still trying to make sure what our security obligations are uh, post GDPR regarding uh, whether we can let people download data. What we will be doing shortly is allowing people to download lists of variants that are for their own data. So if it's your own cases, specifically only your own cases that you're looking at and you're not using a case that's owned by any other group, then 
we will implement that you can download your variant list. One thing for those of you who are still looking at the screen that I didn't show is there's a blue button at the top here next to the run query which says share. If I click on share and then click on share again, what it does is it gives me a, a, a query ID that I can share with another user and they can then go to the same button and load that query ID, so share and load. And if they load in that query, they can reproduce the query. So at least this way you can reproduce any query that you've made in the past that turned up interesting results and you can share it with your, your group or your collaborators who have access to the platform, obviously. Uh, but that's one way to deal with the fact that at the moment you cannot download the, the, CA, the, the final data yet. Okay, and uh, we keep receiving questions, so... Uh, That's great. <laughs> yes. Uh, the next one from Giselle. Does RD Connect need uh, to also upload of solved cases, for example, pathogenic variants identified? So in RD Connect, well, as a whole, in the system as a whole, so we, the, in the Genome Phenome Analysis Platform, the RD Connect tool, uh, we are happy to take solved cases as well. One of the, the, the advantage for us to have solved cases is uh, that you, uh, other people might have a case similar to you and unbeknownst to them, the, the, their case might have the same variant or a very similar variant uh, to your case and that way they could maybe, what we do, what we say is match make, they could find that you, your case is similar to theirs using uh, the matchmaking tool, which I'm not going into today. Uh, and that's why solve cases are useful to us. Also, another thing I didn't show, but for those of you still on the screen, you once you have a variant that you think is of interest, you can tag it within the platform. As it says, this will be visible to all users of the platform for whom where, where that variant turns up in one of their cases, actually. And you can tag this variant uh, as, as being of interest to you. Uh, the, the fields that we have at the moment are designed for a, a subsequent submission to ClinVar if, if you want to do that. Uh, but you can see all the, the variants that people have tagged as, as, as being of interest. And, and in general, if they are tagged, this will be because they think they're the variant responsible for their, their case. And once you're a user and the, and the data is post embargo as well, you can see other people's tagged variants as well. So you can find out if a variant is useful. A variant that you can, if you find a variant in your case that's also been tagged, it, it's very likely that that variant is, is relevant to your case. Next. Sorry, I was, I was muted. So we have a video tutorial on this. So I'm, I'm just pasting the link into the chat. So if you want to watch it, you can, you can see it. Okay, so next question is, um, if we have several patients, and that means more than 100, is it possible to create the phenotypical profiles in HBOs in a batch from an input uh, CSV or uh, XLS file? Yes, so this is something that I didn't show again due to, to limitations of time. But I, if I go back to the, the sub, ah, we don't have it here. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, so we, we do have an Excel sheet that we, uh, like an Excel template that we send out to collaborators who have a lot of samples they want to, to upload. So there's, there's two things here. One is that if your data, if your phenotypic data is already in another phenotypes instance, or for example in Phenome Central that, that some of our collaborators have used, you just, you can export directly from that phenotypes or Phenome Central instance to us and we can import it directly. Uh, that's the fastest way. If you have your phenotypic data in another database, uh, or if you just have it on paper, what we will do is we'll give you a, an Excel template showing the fields that we regard as, as mandatory for you to complete. Uh, and essentially you would complete them within the Excel, which may be fast for you if, if, if the fields have the same characteristics, for example, you can just copy and paste all. And then you would pass that to Excel back to us and then we can insert it into phenotypes for you. So it just depends in these cases, which is the easiest way. If you have a, 
if you have everything included in HPO already and in the standardized database in your host institution, then it might be easy for you to export it in a way that matches the Excel essentially, and then and very easy for us to import. But uh, yeah, this is the it is the most important or the most uh, often the most challenging step is, is to get the phenotypic data uh, in in the correct format. But obviously, there's we we make it as easy as possible. But at some point, it has to be put in an ordered fashion by somebody. So sometimes people find that if it's if it's 20 cases, it's very easy just to, to type them in manually. As you say, if it's 100, if the data is fairly standard, then uh, it might be easier to do it into Excel. Great. Here comes um, another question uh, from CDAP. Oh, I think it's a very important question. Once uploaded, is it possible to re remove cases? So I guess that's particularly relevant uh, yes. if you consider GDPR. Yes. So of course, uh, all cases belong to the PI, so uh, a, uh, a group head has to, if they want to submit data, a group head uh, applies to join RD Connect. The group head is then responsible for all data that is submitted on his behalf. So the group head can uh, nominate other users of his group, naturally who will be submitting the data, most commonly for, for the PI or the clinician. But the data always belongs to the PI, so uh, from a legal, a legal standpoint as well. So any time that uh, a PI asks us to remove their data, the data would be removed completely from the system, of course. You, you remain in complete control. And we do not do anything else with your data out with the system. Um, so the next question uh, is, are there any splice site analysis tools included in the suite of tools? Yes, so we have one thing, that's a good question, from one of our colleagues, uh, one of our uh, centers that was participating in RD Connect uh, from Axe Marseille, University of Axe Marseille, Christophe Beruts Group, uh, and David Salgado. And if you go to the transcript, and if anybody's still watching the screen, you can you'll see it. If you click on a specific tran particular transcript, you'll see a link to something called HFS. And HSF, HSF is the Human Splicing Finder, which is their tool. And if you saw, I've just clicked on it. And it's automatically taken that variant into their tool. Their, their tool has run its analysis on that variant, and then they give a, they give a prediction back. So in this case, it's saying alteration of an exonic a splicing enhancer site, potential alteration of splicing. So that's the that's the primary tool that we have that uh, does more in-depth splice analysis. Of course, any variants that come up as uh, being affecting the canonical site, plus or minus two, I think, will, will be regarded as, as high impact variants and, and they will show us as as a uh, splice variants in the in the report. Uh, but that's the one tool that we have at the moment uh, that we use for more detailed uh, interpretation of putative splicing uh, variants. If anybody who's on the call knows of another tool that they regularly use, we'd be happy to investigate it because we're happy to incorporate anything where we can we can connect to, or we can if the data is freely available, if we can import it, we're we're always happy to improve the platform as much as possible. And uh, I don't know if. Dorota said at the start, but obviously this is we're we we'll come towards the end of the six-year project, but the, the the platform will go on developing and improving uh, going forward. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so even though our first uh, funding period from the European Union is finishing, it doesn't mean that RD Connect is finishing. We're just going to continue with different uh, funding sources. Um, there's one more question. Well, actually, two more questions. Um, is there an email to contact for technical queries or help in the future? Yes, so I wonder if we, sh we should have this. Yeah, okay, yeah, we should, pro we should probably make it more explicit. So yes, there are two. I see there's one for the frequently asked questions, which is platform at rdconnect.eu. I've just posted it on the chat. And we have another one that is uh, help at rdconnect.eu. 
.eu. So I think the, the technical one is, is platform at rdconnect.eu. So if you do have any problems, that's usually your first point of contact, and uh, we usually get back to you very, very quickly. There are occasionally some, some uh, issues, some small issues from time to time arise. Very occasionally the platform might go down for a few minutes. It happened earlier this afternoon. Uh, so never, never. Uh, if anybody has any doubts or any questions or, or they're just not quite sure how something works, uh, that's the, the email to contact and, and we'll get back to you usually within 24 hours, usually within an hour if you're in office hours. Sorry, I was muted. Um, and the last question for now, what about CNV detection? Yeah, so CMV detection. So this is something that we're actively working on uh, at the moment. So see, uh, most of the data we have at the moment is exome data. And, and those of you who are familiar with working with exome data will know that the uh, CMV prediction is quite challenging from exome data in general. Uh, there's, a, there's a very large amount of noise and it's very hard to identify accurately uh, what CMVs are there. However, we do have uh, CMV predictions from two or three tools that we're uh, We've tested that that seem of interest, uh, and I think we will be applying them to the data in the platform, uh, hopefully before the end of the year. We also still have to work out not not just to generate the calls across all the samples, uh, but we have to work out how best to display them in the platform uh, and how best to make them usable. So rather than just providing a list of every possible CMV we detect, which sometimes is over a hundred. CMVs per sample, which you know is definitely a lot of noise. Uh, how to actually provide some quality metrics on the CMVs and how to to integrate them fully with the platform. But I would say that is the next uh, big tool we will be incorporating that we miss at the moment. And one other thing that yeah, one other thing that's an active development. There hasn't been a call. Uh, there hasn't been a question specifically on it, but another thing that's very important uh, when you have when you observe variants here, they're sort of like variants on paper. It's very important to be able to go back and actually look at the the BAM, uh, the alignment file itself. So another thing we're working on is, is integrating a, a viewer. Some of you might be uh, uh, might be familiar with the integrative genome viewer from the Borod, the IGV. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll be exactly that tool, but it would be something similar to that that will show you the, the reads uh, on screen for your variant in real time. Uh, so that way you would have a better idea of, of, of to make sure that the variant is real. This is particularly important probably with with indels, which are often, uh, indels are often have false positive calls in them, whereas most of the single nucleotide variants are reliable. But uh, if you, could see the BAM directly, then often you can tell how good, uh, how likely it is that your variant really is, is biologically true. So that's another important thing that we're we're developing. So uh, all the all these things take a bit of time, and we and we develop a lot in, in parallel. We have a a very good team here, but they're they're very busy as well. Uh, so we have many more things that that we want to add to the platform. Uh, so if I was doing this again in a year's time, I would hope that we have that uh, the CMVs fully called and available and integrated and uh, the BAM viewer uh, available as well. <laughs>